Hey there, my name is David Rogers, and I want to welcome you to the Nashville Jazz Workshop's Artist Spotlight, where every month I get the chance to sit down with a handful of artists with upcoming performances at the legendary Jazz Cave in Nashville, Tennessee. We get to dive into a bit of jazz history while also learning about each artist's process of preparing for their upcoming show. This week, I had the chance to sit down with vocalist and educator Sandra Dudley ahead of her April 27th tribute show to Ella Fitzgerald. Sandra told us about the first time she remembers hearing Ella Fitzgerald, some of the iconic aspects to Ella's vocal style that stand out to her, and Sandra gives us a behind-the-scenes look at how she thinks about putting together a tribute to one of the greatest vocalists of all time. I hope you enjoy. Thanks for making time for this. Absolutely. We're here to talk about your upcoming gig on April 27th. April 27th, said this Saturday. So excited that you're going to be paying homage to the great Ella Fitzgerald. Can you remember the first time you heard Ella? Was it a record or a song? Or do you remember what that experience was like? Well, you know, I'll tell you, David, I grew up in a household of jazz, and my father was an amateur jazz and blues singer. I don't remember the actual first time I heard her, but I know he was playing her in the house from the time I was a city bitty. I know that when I finally first really started getting into her sound and the amazing abilities that she had, I know I was blown away by it. Mm. I was amazed by it. I was the kind of kid that was fascinated by sound about awesome virtuosic singers. And there was big band playing in my house. My dad loved Billy Eckstein. He was listening to, you know, Stan Kenton and everything from that to Earl Garner and you know, organ wow. players and bossa novas, the whole thing. Sure. So I'm sure I heard her sing songs when I was young, but I think it was in high school that I started, you know, I was playing in the jazz band. I was actually playing piano, believe it or not, in, oh, nice. in the high school jazz. And my choral teacher was into jazz and he introduced me to a lot. And I'm sure that's probably where I started to hear some Ella mm -hmm. and was just amazed by her virtuosity in every way. Yeah. Her clarity of tone, her range, the speed at which she could scat. Yeah. And I was just getting into improvisation too okay at that point i was actually listening to people like george benson who would sing and play in the guitar yeah there was a guy living in buffalo named bobby militello he's still alive he's a flute player sax player he'd play flute and sing at the same time while he was scatting so i was i had these improvisational people you know playing right in my town and was listening a lot back then so i was amazed we were talking you're coming up on almost 40 years of teaching now which is just amazing and in those 40 years i know a big part of that was spent singing Ella's music, studying her music, learning more about her. And so when you think about Ella, you had mentioned a few characteristics, but could you speak a little bit more about what stands out to you about like yeah. what makes Ella, Ella? Well, you know, as an educator, it's been really fascinating for me to learn about the great I focused on three female singers that I've lectured on in the past. One is Ella, one is Sarah Vaughn, and one is Carmen McRae. So as I have contrasted these singers and really studied them, the thing that Ella gives us that's different from the other two is definitely her clarity of sound, first of all. A lot of times she's compared to like the clearest horn sound, you know, like a trumpet mm. that's pure. Yes. And so she was clear, and I teach that to my students, the clarity of her tone. She had a sweet tone. Okay. And after that, I would say her flexibility, the fact that she could scat so fast. In other words, she could improvise using those syllables that she just was, you know, listening to all the horn players and what they were doing. And she just she just had a magical ear. It was a gift. It was yeah. a gift from heaven above mm -hmm. that she could just do this because she was not a piano player like Carmen McRae and Sarah Vaughn were. They okay. they actually kind of knew what they were doing, theoretically. Yeah. And Ella was just doing it by ear and was just, it just was a gift. And then I'd say the other thing was her range, how she could, because I'm technical, I know where she's going into chess, where she goes into what's called head voice. Okay. And she'd sing those really high notes in her head voice, you know, and she would use an E vowel a lot. I started doing that because it's kind of an easier vowel to hit up there. Okay. And also, I would say that her phrasing, you know, she was always believable. So mm -hmm. when you think of all the aspects where Sarah Vaughn was very legato and just kind of overdid everything and everything was just her, <laughs> her, her colors. Ella, her range was always even, Stephen, all the way up and down. Also, her phrasing was believable, but she could do it all. She could do the clarity. She could build breathiness when she wanted. She could use the colors and just was an absolute technical giant. You know, when I'm teaching some of her stuff, 
I can use so many healthy things that she did, the clarity, the range, the flexibility, all those things we want in a great voice, yeah. you know, she could do. So with someone who could do it all, it sounds like, when you think about paying tribute to someone like that, who recorded so many great songs that have become just part of the canon of jazz, not just jazz yeah. vocal music, but jazz music, period. How do you even start <laughs> going about <laughs> making decisions about how to pay tribute to someone like this? Is it with songs, yeah. albums, styles? Yeah. I'm going to use kind of a commercial analysis. If someone's going to sing Whitney Houston songs, they better have the belt. They better have, you know, the flexibility and the, you know, the passion, the emotion, you know, yeah. and, and I was in a cover band a long time ago. And I was like, how dare you sing Whitney, but you better be able to sing it to the T. Uh -huh. Well, to me with Ella, if you're going to do what I'm attempting to do, which I, what I usually tell the audience is I've got Ella in my head, okay. like she's in my head. I'm not going to necessarily try to imitate her sound, going to use my sound, but I'm going to try to think like she thinks mm. when I'm singing. And that's the difference. That way they don't think I'm just imitating. But when I've prepared these songs, I want to do some of the iconic things like the Ella in Berlin, How High the Moon Solo. Yes, I was going to ask you. Right. Yeah. So that's going to be my closing number because that's like right. kind of my big, you know, but I don't do all of her solo. Trust me. Matter of fact, I was just singing. I was practicing yesterday, getting it back in my head. Sure. And I only do probably about a quarter of her solo because it goes on for about 10 minutes. Yes. Plus, she was 43 when she recorded that. <laughs> And I am, you know what, three. <laughs> so, you know, I, and then I like doing my own thing, too. Of so course. I do a little bit of Ella and then I do some. So one is I have so much fun recreating that song uh -huh. or a song like Blue Skies, where mm. I actually have taught my students to do the transcription of her solo in that song. So I love doing that. And those are some of the songs with the scat. Then I love to do some of the ballads that she made famous, like, you know, Misty. I know people probably have heard that song their whole lives, but the way she sings it mm. and what she does to it, yes. again, it's in my head, and I love singing that. So some of them are just songs I love as well that maybe have been in my repertoire long enough that I can really do this, you know, mm -hmm. with thinking about her. But it is hard because she has so many songs. And, of course, there's the American Songbook. She recorded so many of them, from the Cole Porter to the Gershwin, you know, Harold Arlen. So I have a nice cross-section of those different songbooks that I want to feature as well. We are in for a treat. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> Again, that's April 27th, Saturday at 730. Will you tell us who will be joining you? as part yes. of this performance? So Lori Meacham on piano. What? And Lori and I have done this presentation before. I've changed it a little bit for this setting. Okay. We've done it at the Frist as part of Jazz on the Move. So I, she knows the tunes. She knows what I'm doing. And then Roger Spencer, of course, on bass. And I've been friends with them for, for almost 30 years because they played my audition at Belmont. Wow. Lori, <laughs> Lori and Roger. <laughs> and we're instant friends. Of and as soon as I got here, I got involved with the workshop with them. And then Larry Aberman on drums and he's new to town, but we've got a great story. Okay. When he came to town really quickly, he informed me that he had played with me on a gig at Eastman School of Music where I ended up doing my master's. He played drums on, a, on I think it was a studio orchestra arrangement that my husband, Bruce Dudley, arranged for me called Love for Sales, really one of the first big jazz performances that I did at wow. Eastman. I was a classical major there. When he came to and met me at the workshop one day, he said, you know, I'm Larry and I played with you at Eastman. I'm like, what? What on earth? So then, <laughs> what a small world. Cool, yeah, it was the coolest thing. So we've reunited playing a few gigs and I'm so happy he's on. He's a monster drummer. He's played yes. everything from rock to, to jazz to everything in between. So I'm really excited. Well, fantastic. Again, we are in for a treat Saturday, mm -hmm. April 27th. Sandra, thank you again so much for taking the time to chat and give us a little sneak peek into your preparation and your process. I can't wait. David, thank you so much. It meant so much to me that you reached out to me for this. And I hope people come out. Tickets are going fast. Get your tickets. We're going to have a blast.